Hello there. I am currently hiding under my desk. A group of masked men smashed through my back door and are currently rummaging around downstairs. Not sure, sure who they are. They kept screaming about unionists, so maybe they're upset that I called Derry Londonderry one time. I mean, that is its official name. Uh, but I'm on a tight schedule, so I guess I'll just have to record in here for now. Uh, let's talk about this video's sponsor, Campfire Blaze. Campfire Blaze is a browser-based suite of tools that keep track of all your world-building and story notes, with character sheets, maps, timelines, encyclopedias, and more. This sort of organization is great for world-building, RPG campaigns, and any other sort of writing you can think of. Your creations can be shared publicly with others, but only if you want to. Even real-time collaboration on projects is possible, and it's way more intuitive than something like Google Docs. All these modules can be yours, or you can pick and choose the parts you need. At either a one-time purchase or a monthly subscription, Campfire Blaze can be customized to suit whatever purposes you need it for, and whatever price you can afford. Not sure if you want to commit to paying for all this? There's a free tier, so you can try everything without paying a dime. It even has a month-long free trial and a refund option, so you can change your mind at any time. Click the link in the description to see if Campfire Blaze is right for you. Now, if you'll excuse me, I have to go figure out how to pronounce... Tiokfade Arla? Tiokfader Arle? Tiok. Oh man. Okay, so, uh, Onision. The man, the myth, the. Well, Onision. So, I'm assuming if you clicked on this, you're at least somewhat familiar with him. He's basically just an internet guy who does a lot of different things. He's done YouTube comedy, he's done music, he's started a cult a while ago. Uh, and at one point, he did write several books. And lots of other people have already talked about them. That It's a trilogy of sorts, and, well, they're they're terrible. They're, they're terrible in every conceivable way. They're just, they're awful. Greg has no idea, his real name's Greg, if you were unfamiliar. He has no idea how to write books at all, and that's why these had to be self-published, because no traditional publisher would ever even consider publishing these. Uh, but... For a long time, people have been asking me, James, you should do something with those. You should review them. You should do some." And I really didn't want to because, like I said, other people have already done it. You know, other people have already gone into crazy, crazy depth, and I don't think there's anything more I can add to the conversation. Uh, but that said, I was curious about them, and so I did read them around the beginning of the year, and who, who, Nelly, these are even worse than... I could possibly explain. Like, I, I realize that in a review you can get a lot across, especially if it's long and in-depth, but man, these are just absolutely miserable to get through in ways that it's really impossible to describe without you going through it yourself. And I was thinking, like, okay, I have to make all this... I have to do something with all this time that I just wasted reading these. And I thought about it, and I realized that the entire time I was reading, I kept thinking to myself, Man, if I wrote this, I would have changed this, I would have changed that, I would have done this. And it re it made me realize, hey, I could just do a hypothetical rewrite of Onision's books and show how to make them good. Now, I'll be right up front and say, it is much easier to edit something after it's already finished than it is to create something from scratch. You know, like, Onision did the hard work... I, I, no, I'm not going to put quotes around it. I'm, Onision did the hard work of actually writing these things, which does take, you know, time and energy and motivation. So I'll, I'll give him that much, at least. He's he's a piece of shit, but, you know, I'll give him that much. Uh, and I'm just coming in with the benefit of hindsight and saying, hey, if we just tweaked this and that and this other thing, then it would be a lot better. Uh, so I'll, I'll come right out and admit that. Uh, but at the same time, I'm not going to be doing a line-by-line -line rewrite of this, which I could do, you know, but... Like, no, why, why would I ever do that? E even if I did that, why would anyone be interested in watching me go over it? So basically, what I'm going to do is I'm going to keep the important stuff similar. Uh, not necessarily the exact same, but like the important plot points and everything uh, will be, you know, the, the same. The important character beats will be the same. Uh, but for example, in Stones to Abigail, I, ch I uh, changed the order of some of the big events so they make a little bit more sense and they actually escalate. Uh, and I might change the way that some of the big events happen. And in some areas, I do have to take liberties and, you know, make some stuff up that Greg just left completely blank, essentially. But, 
y you know, it's the best I can do. And I will come right out and say that, yes, while I am making his books into something tolerable, I don't think the they are gonna be the greatest things ever. I still think they'll be kind of dumb, but... Well, no, no, that's it. They just, they, they, they'll still be kind of dumb. And uh, so I just, so I don't wind up repeating myself over and over again. There will be some basics that I would change going through that I just think kind of go without saying. For example, uh, fix all the spelling, grammatical, and formatting errors. Like, yes, obviously, fix all that. Uh, better descriptions in prose, because Greg has about 12 different adverbs in every sentence, and it, every sentence goes on four times longer than it needs to. But at the same time, he gives basically no description at all about anything that goes on, you know. Very little description about what characters look like, what the environments look like, uh, what happens when there's action going on, like, just very little. Uh, and I, I genuinely think that if he were to give proper descriptions in these books, then each of them would be two and a half to three times longer. Also, just less detail on the sex scenes. You know, some of these sex scenes I'll cut out entirely, and I'll mention that as I go forward, but just some of them, like, just do a tasteful cutaway, and then it's the next morning, or something like that. I just, just, I don't know. And beyond that, if I don't mention any scenes that, uh, in particular, or any plot points in particular, just assume that it was done in more or less the same way, but it was written better. Okay, just, just assume that. And also, I don't have a physical copy of any of his books, because I just read it on PDF, I'm not giving him money, so... This copy of A Sky Beyond the Storm is just going to substitute for all of the books in the Onion Trilogy. And anyways, uh, I'm not going to go into a lot of detail in the summary, so if you want that, go watch a different review and then come back, because we're about to get started with the first entry in the Onion Trilogy, Stones to Abigail. Out of all of Greg's books, this is definitely the best. I mean, it's still terrible, but you know, it. I, I will give it credit that it at least feels earnest. Like, you know, he was trying to create something profound and something that was actually good. He just failed at it, whereas the other two are much more blatant self-inserts. Uh, but, that said, the actual story of Stones to Abigail is pretty basic and, well, easy to understand. Basically, there's a high school student named James Patrick. He just goes to a crappy high school somewhere in the United States. He's introverted and socially awkward, and he kind of has a crush on this girl named Abby, and they wind up dating for a while, and she's also being abused by her father, and her life is torment, and everything sucks, and blah blah blah, and James kind of saves her from that because he's just the coolest guy ever, and in exchange, she has sex with him. Um, <laughs> we're not going to talk about that. Uh, and then there's a school shooting, and a bunch of their classmates die, and then the president shows up, and there's various other tragedies in James's life, and then it just kind of ends. You know, so it's a mostly realistic, if it was anime, it'd be called Slice of Life uh, storyline. You know, it's just meant to be a drama with some elements of comedy in there. And it fails at that, but at the same time, it's the easiest one to fix. So to start off, we'll keep James pretty much as is. You know, we'll keep it with him being a loner except for his friend Davis, uh, we'll keep it so that he's kind of judgmental of the other students around him and he thinks of himself as superior and smarter and everything, when in reality he's just kind of an asshole teenager. And yes, that would make him somewhat insufferable, but like, a lot of teenagers really are like that. I certainly was when I was that age, and I don't think they ever specify, but he's probably between 16 and 18 years old. Um, and also, keeping him you know, isolated and awkward and everything gives a lot of opportunity for character development, for uh, him getting better and becoming a better person over the course of the story. Uh, and then there's one little detail I would add is that he really loves puzzles. Because that's the thing about James Patrick in Onision's version is he has like no hobbies or interests whatsoever. He just kind of hangs out with his friend Davis sometimes and then later he starts having sex with Abby and that, that's really all he does. Whereas in this, at least giving him that one little hobby, you know, he loves Rubik's Cubes and Sudoku puzzles and uh, he loves doing like amateur code breaking stuff, like just that one little thing, making him passionate about that one thing gives him an actual personality. One of the earliest things that happens in this book is that this bully character named Jason uh, attacks James and beats him up and 
no one really cares about it, and James basically just looks at it as, oh, everyone at the school is a violent douchebag, and they, they're all terrible people, and I'm so abused and oppressed and everything like that. Uh, whereas, yeah, and yeah, obviously, getting bullied like that would really suck, uh, but I think it'd be better if in this one, James still gets beat up, but he attempts to fight back a little, and he fails. Now, that, that's an important thing to note, is that he, in the original book, James just decided later on that he's a god-tier badass, and so he beats up Jason and three of his jock friends in a parking lot outside school, and he does it without even really getting hurt himself, which is pretty much impossible, even if you are the most badassest badass of all badass of all time if you don't have any weapons or anything at least and well it just feels like stupid wish fulfillment whereas in this if we showcase right from the start that yeah james is just kind of a normal guy if if he's getting beat up by a jock then there's not much he can do then it pretty quickly takes that element out of the, off the table so around this time james and abby uh wind up working together on an art project in school and the, the way it's set up in the original book is kind of weird because Abby's just like, I don't want to work with this guy, and then she specifically points out James, like, I want to work with him, even though they don't really know each other. And it's, it's just kind of an odd uh, setup to put in there. So I just decided, you know what, James and Abby will just be randomly assigned to work together. You know, that sort of shit happens all the time. And at first, Abby, uh, because she's also kind of isolated and doesn't like talking to people, uh, similar to James, she's kind of put off by him at first because she's like, oh, that's that weird guy. I don't really like talking to him. But then she sees him working on like Sudoku or code breaking or a Rubik's Cube or, you know, puzzles of some sort. And then she she tells him, hey, I also kind of like that. And they bond a little bit over that. See, that's the thing. They bond. They have some sort of common interest here, which they really didn't have in the original book. Like, just having that one little connection to start off with, and then as time goes on, they realize, oh, we actually really like each other. There you go. And you could have it so that James uh, kind of has a crush on her at, uh, before they start this bit, or you can have it so that he didn't really think about her until this very moment. But, you know, either way, this is where they actually get to know each other. And uh, at some point during all this, when they're starting to become friends, James notices uh, signs of her abuse. like. Uh, he notices that, oh, she has some bruises and stuff, she's, someone's hurting her, uh, but she kind of, you know, withdraws from it. She's like, look, don't talk to me about that, and that sort of thing. This is, of course, in spite of James trying to comfort her. You know, he tries to tell her, oh, you know what, you're abused and everything, but I still like you, the world is still perfect, or maybe not. the world is still uh, worth living in, yada yada. You know, just things that an awkward teenager would say, because... He's not trained to deal with this sort of thing, and he wants to help, but he has no idea how to do it. And then he realizes, oh, okay, maybe that was a weird thing for me to say. Uh, and then, later, after this, like, when him and Abby haven't really talked for a couple of days or something, he gets beat up by Jason again, because it's kind of implied that this sort of thing happens a lot. Uh, and after he gets beat up, he just kind of picks himself up, and, you know, he's obviously hurting, bruised, bleeding, whatever. And then he goes off with his friend Davis, and Davis kind of comforts him, and, you know, James obviously isn't happy or anything, but, you know, Abby witnesses this, and she realizes, you know what, maybe, may, may, maybe I don't have to be alone in my suffering, essentially, is what she's realizing. And so she sends James a coded message of some sort, like, hey, do you still want to be friends? I'm sorry, etc. Now, again, something similar happened in the uh, original book, she just sends him a coded message, which turned out to be her phone number, but they never mention that either character is into puzzles or anything, and so it just comes off as kind of odd, and like, also, why would James assume it was a coded message? Why would he assume it was meant for him? It, it It's just an odd plot point. There's a lot of li odd little moments like that in Onision's books, but also odd big moments, which are even weirder in a strange way. And so from this point forward, Abby, Davis, and James just become friends. Now that's important to note, they're friends. James can still kind of have a crush on her and think she's pretty and all that, but they don't immediately hop into a bed together, they don't immediately start having hot makeout sessions or anything like that. They're just, you know, she needed to connect with someone because she didn't really have any friends, and James was kind of lonely, Davis was also a little bit lonely, and so they're all just, yeah, we're, we'll be buds together. They go off and 
I don't know. I don't know. They solve puzzles together or something. They, you know, they're they're just friends. It doesn't really matter what they do so long as they're together sometimes. And then, uh, just like in the uh, original Stones to Abigail, Jason at one point uh, feels up Abby in the middle of class and no one does anything about it. And just like in the original Stones to Abigail, James tries to fight him, but like I mentioned earlier, he loses. You know, <laughs> he, he just can't fight uh, Jason. He's a much bigger guy and James isn't some secret Bruce Lee badass. Like, it's just, it's not going to happen. But... While it's happening, it'll be kind of like that scene in the first Captain America movie where he's getting beat up in an alleyway, and the other guy keeps expecting him to stay down, but he keeps jumping back up, and he's saying, hey, I can do this all day. And after this, Jason starts to respect James, in a way. He's like, you know what? I, I beat this guy up a lot, but he, he, he knew, knowing that I would kick his ass, he came to me angry about what I did with his friend, and he's still coming at me even after I beat him up. Like... Huh. And, like, it causes Jason to kind of rethink some stuff, and eventually he just says, All right, whatever, dude, I'm leaving, and he, he goes off. Like, he doesn't outright come out and say, I respect you now because of that, but, like, the subtext will get that across. And also, like in the original Stones to Abigail, James is going to run for school president. Sort of. In the original book, it was just near the end, two teachers just randomly decided that, hey, this James kid should run for school president uh, because he's the main character, I guess, and the main character has to run for school president. I don't know. It's, just, it's a weird plot point, and James winds up not really wanting to do it, and he doesn't go along with it, and then the book ends, so it really doesn't add anything. Whereas in this version, uh, C. Davis, in both versions, is going to be kind of a happy-go-lucky jokester comedian type guy. Uh, obviously, he's not funny in the original because Onision isn't funny. But in this, we'll just... broad strokes, we'll just say he's funnier. And uh, he suggests that James run for class president and he'll be his vice presidential uh, candidate just as a joke. You know, because obviously they're the outcasts and no one really likes them and they kind of hate everybody. But just as a joke, they're going to be putting up uh, posters and doing bizarre campaign stunts and, you know, things like that. And James is kind of reluctant. Again, he doesn't really want to do it. But because Davis is his friend and he wants to help out his friend, he goes along with it and it gives them something to do together. And even though he's a little annoyed and doesn't really like the attention, he's he has some fun with it. And then, of course, there's the school shooting. Abby's ex-boyfriend, Seth, comes in with an M16 and kills 50 other classmates and wounds another four. And while this is happening, James try <laughs> he roller skates around for a little while, not explaining that because it doesn't make sense originally either. Um, and then he's looking for Abby, and then he's about to get shot by Seth, and then Jason comes in and actually disarms Seth and beats him into a, a coma, I think. And then the, the day is saved, and then James finds Abby and comforts her. But he doesn't actually do anything to stop the school shooting, and it's pretty clearly uh, put in there as an, for Onision to push an anti-gun message. Now, <clears throat> here's the thing. I, I disagree with Onision's message here, and so if I were to write this book, I wouldn't put that in there. But this isn't me rewriting the book into what I would write, this is me writing it, or this is me turning it into a better version of what Greg tried to write. So, after thinking it over a little, uh, essentially I just have to strengthen that anti-gun message. I just, I disagree with it, but you know, that's, that's whatever. He, he's allowed to write things I disagree with. And so thinking about that a little, I would say that, well, one, Seth couldn't have an M16 because normal civilians actually can't own those. Uh, and so I would say, uh, specify that Seth bought some sort of other gun. It, I don't think the exact type really matters. It could be like a shotgun or just a handgun or something, because, you know, if you're, you're, it's a bunch of unarmed targets. We've seen a lot of different types of guns used in these types of shootings. But, you know, specify that they live in a state with relatively loose gun laws and that Seth was over 18, so he was able to just go in and buy it without too much issue, and then he used it to shoot up the school. And so, yeah, I think that would strengthen the message. I would still disagree with it if I came across that in the wild, but it does at least 
follow some real-world logic. Now, during the actual events of the shooting, rather than James uh, hearing gunshots right after he gets off the school bus and then getting back on and then getting off again to look for Abby, uh, we'll just have it start during school. You know, it could be during lunchtime, or it could be right before the bell rings and classes start, or something like that. Just during school, you know, him and Davis are together, and then they hear gunshots, and rather than running like everyone else does, uh, they immediately panic and think, oh god, where's Abby? We need to make sure she's okay, so they run off to go find her. And then as they're running off to go find her, they run into Seth as he's, you know, shooting up other people, and Seth shoots Davis, and Davis, you know, collapses, and James is like, oh shit, what's going on? And then, uh, James decides to distract him for a minute to maybe draw him away from his friend or draw him away from other people or something, and he gets shot in not anywhere that would kill him. You know, I'm not going to say James is dying at the end. I'm saying he gets shot somewhere non-vital, like in the leg or the foot or something, and then uh, while he's distracted, Jason comes in and disarms him. And it, in that way, it follows pretty much the same, uh, I don't know, formula. It, it follows the s same events as the original book, but in this case, James actually did something. You know, it, it could be as simple as he threw something at Seth to distract him, and that gave Jason just enough time to grab him and beat him up. And this could also be, in a weird way, a kind of bonding moment for <laughs> James and Jason, because they do bond a little bit in the original book, but that's because... Jason feels up his girlfriend and then James beats him up in a parking lot. Whereas in this, it's Jason kind of respects him for taking so many punches and then, oh, they helped each other out here. So they don't, they aren't necessarily friends by the end, but they do have some strange sort of camaraderie at the end. Uh, and then James will go over to Davis and realize, oh shit, he's dead. This really sucks. And again, in the original book, Davis does die, but that's because he ran out onto the highway and got hit by a car, and it's it, it's kind of weird and comes out of nowhere. Uh, whereas in this, at least it ties into some sort of climax. So James, because obviously he's been shot, uh, he does get carried away in an ambulance and goes to the hospital, and then while he's there, Abby finally finds him in his room or wherever he is, and then she just kind of breaks down crying. And at first, James is like, oh, okay, Obviously, our friend is dead, and a bunch of our classmates are dead, and she probably saw dead bodies and stuff. It's okay for her to be upset, uh, and he's kind of trying to tell her, ah, look, I'm I'm okay, yada yada. They're, they're both upset at the moment, so he doesn't really know how to react. Uh, and then she confesses that she wrote a letter to Seth in which she wished everyone would disappear so she could be alone for a while. And James hears this, and he gets upset and yells at her for a while, tells her, get the fuck out of here, you killed Davis, etc., that sort of thing. And she, you know, leaves crying, obviously, and very upset. Now, in the original book, yes, this, this happened in a similar way, because way long after the school shooting, she admits, yes, she did write a letter like that, and obviously, she wasn't telling him to shoot up the school, like, not even implying it at all. It, it's just, she's venting, she was in a difficult place in her life, and she's like, God, I want to be alone for a while. I want everyone to go away. And uh, James, hearing that, at this point in the original book is, you know, they've been together for a long time, and she's been giving him support and everything, and he still walks out on her because he's being melodramatic. It really makes James come across as a dick when he does that. Whereas in this situation, yeah, James is being kind of a dick when he says that, but... I mean, he was shot, his best friend was killed, and other people were all killed, and it's not something that happened a while ago the way it was in the book, it's something that happened very recently, it's, so it's still fresh in his mind. It makes sense why he would snap and lash out at her, even though she doesn't really deserve it. But of course, later he'll realize, after cooling down a little, that, you know what, she didn't do anything wrong, she certainly didn't want this to happen, and he forgives her. And then, the president visits. Now, in the, uh, in the original book, it really doesn't make sense for the president to visit a school that just had a shooting because there's so many of those, the president would not have time to visit after every shooting, which is uh, definitely an indictment of American society, but, you know, it's, that's, a, that's a separate discussion. But in this, just it's very simple to change it. Just make it so that it's an election year, and the, pres the president's running for re-election, and he's running on an anti-gun message, or a pro-gun control message, however you want to put that. 
And so, it, yeah, it would make sense for him to go to the scene of this really big tragedy and just talk about how, hey, we could have prevented this if we did X, Y, Z. And then, so, just like in the original, he'll make a speech, uh, and he'll congratulate James, only this time James actually did something, and he'll also congratulate Jason. I'm just now realizing I wrote Justin in my notes for some reason, but that's because, well, that's because Onision likes to have every character, all their names start with the same letter, and it's actually kind of confusing to keep track of, and at several points, I'm pretty sure he accidentally switches characters around. Like, I don't think it happens in Stones to Abigail, but I swear in This Is Why I Hate You, it happens more than once. And around this time, James's mom sees that Abby is in an abusive home, like her dad is, you know, hitting her uh, way beyond the point of what's acceptable, and so he helps get her out of her home and into a more stable environment while she's recovering from the shock of, oh, a bunch of my classmates were just fucking murdered, and I saw dead bodies, and yada yada. Um, only, in the original book, she stayed at James's house, uh, and also she let them sleep in the same bed. Okay. And also, also, she moves out of the house for a while, but she still lets them live there while she's paying for everything. Again. Okay. In this one, uh, none of that shit. She, she's not going to do that. Like, maybe she'll let Abby stay with them for a little bit, but uh, she'll see her and James, like, fooling around or something at some point, so then she's like, okay, you're not you're not staying here anymore, but obviously she can't send her back to her own home, so she'll have him live, live with uh, James's aunt or something, you know, family or friends that are in town somewhere where she can be stable and nearby and still attend school and everything, but her and James won't wind up doing something stupid. And then we'll end the book with James at Davis's funeral, where he, you know, realizes that life goes on even without my best friend here, and he decides that not caring about things is dumb because I liked having friends and stuff. This will, of course, contrast with James's earlier attitude of deciding the world is stupid and I'm above everything, and so, you know, character development. The character changed. <laughs> and this will help make the book actually be somewhat consistent and have something actually resembling themes, and it'll have a sense of escalation, and that sort of thing. And I think if you wrote a book like this, I don't... I don't know if I'd be particularly interested in reading it, but I know other people would be, and I don't think it would win any awards, but at least it would have a purpose for having a school shooting in there. So now we move on to the second entry in the Onision trilogy, This Is Why I Hate You. This one is a lot harder to streamline, I'll be honest, I had to think about how to do this one for a while, because the plot is basically non-existent. It's it's basically just this guy named Arthur who is also a high school student who also hates everybody except he's much more of a violent asshole than James is and then he leaves high school and joins the military and then some stuff happens and then he dies and it really doesn't tie into all that much and I realized after a while that this one really tries to be a character study of Arthur because Onision says in the intro for this book that James in Stones to Abigail was the light, and Arthur is the darkness, which is, um... I'll, I'll just let you figure out on your own why that one's stupid. But, after I realized that that's what it was trying to do, I think I could change the plot a little bit more in this one than I did, to Stones, than I did with Stones to Abigail. Like, you know, not, not too much. It'll still be recognizably similar, but it's... I, I have to take a few more liberties here, okay? Like, there's just... There's no way that the framework Onision provided could really make Arthur come across as anything other than edgy, violent wish fulfillment who lives in a fantasy land where he can do whatever he wants. So just like Stones to Abigail, we'll start this one off the same. Uh, Arthur kind of hates everything and complains about everything, especially his father, uh, and we'll also make him be violent and kind of a good fighter. Now, we'll, it, it's said in the book that his mom just taught him how to fight, which is not really much of an explanation, but I think if we, like, throw in some flashbacks and some more actual detail, we can maybe get away with that. So we'll leave that in. We'll leave it in that he is a good fighter just because, well, it's kind of central to the character. He's That's one of the few things he's good at. Uh, and then we'll also throw in that his dad gets a new girlfriend and that Arthur really fucking hates her and is like, grr, that frog face 
vegetarian bitch. I, I can't stand her because he just he's kind of just an insufferable douchebag and he can't stand anyone. Just like in the original book, we'll have him bond with a girl named Ashley and they'll start dating, but we'll give them an actual reason to bond. Like, you know, they'll have some sort of shared interest. You know, they'll both like sports or video games or baking or just literally anything. Literally anything at all would be better than what we have in the original book. And, um, basically they'll be dating for a while and she'll leave him because he fights the guy who assaulted her. Now I realize that a similar plot point popped up in Stone to Abigail, but that's because Greg has no imagination. Yeah, basically they're dating for a while, this dude touches her inappropriately, Arthur fights her, and he'll... He actually, in the original book, just straight up stomps on the guy's arm and breaks it but he avoids getting expelled from school somehow. And in the original book, I'm jumping ahead a little, but uh, in this one, yeah, he'll just be expelled for that. And that's also going to cause Ashley to leave him. And, uh, but that's skipping ahead, like I said. And at some point while they're dating, he's going to admit to her that his, when he was a child, his dad molested him. And that's why he's so angry and why he hates his dad so much. In the original book, this comes in during the epilogue as kind of a way of excusing why Arthur um, was the way he was and why he hated his dad so much, which would have been fine if they had at least hinted at it before that, but they didn't. It just kind of comes in at the last second as kind of more of an excuse than an explanation. And uh, also on, on that subject, Arthur just straight up did not remember it until partway through the story when he starts going to some therapy sessions and then he realizes, oh, that's what my dad did to me. So it, it, it just, it, it's just a plot hole, which will be closing here. You know, he, he admits to his girlfriend that happened. And so there we go. And he gets expelled for fighting, gets his GED and his dad's pissed at him and everything, but they're still, you know, living together. And just like in the original book, uh, him, his dad and his girlfriend are going to go on some sort of road trip. Arthur is going to get into a fight with his dad, and he's going to kick him in the face a couple of times. And in the original book, this actually... He just straight up... His dad's girlfriend pulls Arthur's boots off while they're fighting, and then Arthur runs off barefoot into the wilderness and gets stranded, because, you know, they're in the middle of nowhere on a road trip. And then later, Arthur gets arrested and sent to juvie, and that's what gets him expelled from school, which... Yeah, okay, we're just not going to... We're not going to do that because it's stupid. However, in this version... He'll still fight his dad in the car, but he, rather than going to jail or anything, his dad's just going to be pissed at him and he's like, you know what, you got your GED, get the fuck out of my house. And so, yeah, at this point, Arthur has been thrown out of his house, he's no longer going to school, and he no longer has his girlfriend, so maybe he'll drift around for a while, homeless or something, or maybe he'll just decide right away to join the Air Force, just like in the original. So while he's going through basic training, and then he later leaves and goes to a different environment and has, you know, some structure in his life for the first time, he realizes that he kind of likes it. You know, he likes being away from his dad. He likes getting exercise. He's meeting new people. And in particular, he gets along really well with a lieutenant colonel at his base, which in the original book was just a an excuse for him to be able to gouge people's eyes out without getting in trouble because the lieutenant colonel will cover it up. It's, just, it it's stupid and really doesn't make sense. Whereas in this... Yeah, it, it makes sense. He could be friendly with the lieutenant colonel as long as he's not doing anything too egregiously awful. And at some point during this, uh, he'll meet these two girls and they all kind of like each other and they wind up becoming a polyamorous thruple. Y you know, it's similar to what happened in the original book, only in that one, it was like a, a lesbian started not being a lesbian because she liked... Arthur so much, which is really not how lesbians work, but yeah, yeah, okay, we're just, <laughs> yeah, we're, we're not opening that can of worms, but yeah, basically, Arthur just decides, you know what, I'm, I'm enjoying life, and I kind of like what, where everything's headed right now. Now, meanwhile, while all of this is go going on, he'll have some sort of rivalry with another airman named Austin, just like in the original book, uh, and it really doesn't matter how or why they become rivals, it just matters they don't really like each other, and so they will just kind of take pot shots at each other at every opportunity. Like, nothing that'll get either of them in too much trouble, but, like, just taunting one another, basically. And at some point, Austin will somehow find out that Arthur was molested by his father, and then he will 
you know, bring that up and taunt him about it, and Arthur is just gonna snap because, like, okay, bro, you took this way too far, and he'll just attack him, brutally beat him, injure him, you know, whatever, something like that. And because of that, he will be discharged. Like, that's the thing. Even if the other guy taunts you like that, it, if you don't have the kind of discipline and control to avoid brutally attacking someone in that situation, the military will throw you out. So let's, let's be clear on that subject. Like, you might get a general discharge if you're lucky, but most likely you'd be, get an honor, a dishonorable discharge. And so, uh, because he's friendly with the lieutenant colonel, the lieutenant colonel manages to avoid uh, having Austin press any charges. So, Gre Greg, <laughs> I keep calling one to call him Greg because he's very clearly a self-insert. But Arthur will be, you know, thrown out of the military, and he'll have no job and nowhere to live, and his two girlfriends are gone so he's you know isolated and in a bad place in his life again and so he's forced to go back home and beg his dad to let him stay and while this is going on uh the readers and everything are realizing man this this really really sucks that he's in this position but he has no other choice and his dad agrees you know enough time has passed that he's like okay i forgive you you're still my son i love you blah 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 and arthur will probably have to avoid uh the urge to do something violent to him, but he he will avoid it for the time being at least. And then at some point while this is going on, Arthur will see some sort of evidence that his dad is molesting some other child, and then he'll just straight up kill him. You know, he'll be like, you know what, old man, you're, you're dead. Yep, I I've lost everything. I don't care anymore. And it, it really doesn't matter how he kills him, but he kills him. And then at some point the police are called. Maybe his dad's girlfriend calls him or something, and. He will not react very well to that, and something will go down, and the police will kill him. So, that's how he'll die. In the original, it was that Austin and his other goons were, uh... I don't even like talking about it, but basically they were trying to sexually assault Arthur's two girlfriends, and then he just decides, well, I'm gonna kill you guys all now, and he kills them all, but in the process, one of the other guys kills him. So this keeps that same idea of Arthur being... Well, one, a crazy badass, two, a violent kind of psycho guy, and three, he's just defending someone innocent from being uh, sexually abused. And yeah, admittedly, this version is still kind of exploitative and everything, but, uh, well, at least it ties into why Arthur is such a dark character rather than being something that's kind of separate. And then we'll end it with a journal entry from one of his girlfriends, just like the original, and yeah, that'll be kind of it. Now, this is still edgy, still dumb, still kind of plotless, but it is an actual character study. Not necessarily a very good one, but at least it does show, you know, how someone could become this way and what it leads to. You know, it, it shows that, he, yes, he had some pretty bad trauma in his life, and that trauma wound up breaking him in the end, whereas James's trauma, because remember, the light and darkness motif that we're trying to go with, James's trauma strengthened him and made him a better person. Arthur's broke him down and made him a worse person. That's uh, kind of the best I could do with <laughs> with This Is Why I Hate You. It's th th Yeah, there's really not a lot to work with, but that would be better than Greg's book. And finally, we come to the finale, Reaper's Creek. Now this one, this one was by, by far the hardest to fix because this is like eight different books all meshed into one. It's like Greg got like 20 pages in writing one book and then decided that he felt like doing something else. So he just tried to change the plot into another direction for a while and then change it in something else. And so there's just a lot of weird stuff going on. It's like, okay, first this, it's just another drama about this kid living in kind of a crappy situation. And then, oh, okay, he's being abducted by aliens. And then, oh, okay, he has mind powers. And then, oh, okay, he's a god. And the shortest, simplest way I can think to explain the plot is a kid finds out he has powers and then he kills God. So in this one, just like the others, we'll start it off more or less the same. Uh, the main character is an 11-year-old kid named Daniel who lives out in this rural area. There's the big forest behind his house where he goes to play in, and then there's also a creek, you know, the Reaper's Creek. And Daniel can also see death. You know, in the original book, he sees a red glow whenever uh, something dies, whether it's an animal or a person or something, and it kind of comes out of nowhere, and they don't really do much with it. Uh, 
and in this book it'll just introduce the powers right away without any bullshit or anything. Uh, he can see dead things, and his in his mind it's just always been that way, but whenever he tells people about it, they don't believe him, because, you know, he's, he's an 11-year-old kid, they just assume he's making up stories. And, great, that's, that's already kind of an interesting setup. Let's go from there. And then we'll also, pretty close to the beginning, we'll just have the, the first alien abduction happen. Like, he'll, he'll be taken by aliens, they'll do weird experiments on him, and he'll think, oh god, this is terrifying, but he won't really be hurt, at least not physically, and then they'll send him back, and he'll be like, whoa, that's crazy, and when he tries to tell people about it, the, they won't really believe him, because again, he, this is the kid that tells us he can see dead things, we just assume that he likes to make up stories. Great. And in the, in the original book, it's not made clear if this is the first time that the aliens have abducted him or not, because it's treated pretty casually. It's just, uh, Daniel, Daniel goes, oh, hey, I was abducted by aliens. Cool. Like, it's, it's weird in the original, but at least in this, again, it's, it, it will be brought in early on so it doesn't feel weird when it comes in later. And the aliens will use some sort of mind powers uh, while they have Daniel there. Like, they might be moving objects with their minds, or they'll be speaking to him telepathically, or, you know, something like that, something along those lines, so that we can see, okay, these powers exist in this universe. You know, it's called setup and payoff, which Onision doesn't understand. And after that, we will keep the bully subplot from the original, because in the original, there's just this character named Philip, who is kind of a little asshole who Daniel doesn't like, and he tries to beat up Daniel, but then Daniel beats him up instead because he's a badass. And in the original book, Daniel just kind of assumes at one point that Philip is being abused at home. Like, he never sees any evidence of it, but he just kind of assumes, yeah, he's acting out because he has a crappy home life. Yeah, that, that, that's what's going on. I understand how this works. Uh, whereas in this, we'll just, we'll keep it simple. Daniel actually sees Philip abused at some point. You know, maybe he's out in the woods with his dad, and his dad, like, is smacking him around, or he's just walking down the street one time and sees it, or you know, something along those lines. G give him an actual reason to feel sympathy for Philip, even though Philip is kind of an asshole. Uh, and we'll also leave out the fact that they fight at one point and Daniel wins. You know, we'll, we'll cut that out because, again, this isn't about Daniel being some god-tier martial artist or anything. It's like, we'll just leave that out, and at some point they will just become friends instead because they're 11 years old and at the end of the day most of what they do there doesn't really matter and they can put it behind them. Great. In the original book, right after they fight, the narration basically just says, and that was the last time I ever saw Philip because he died not long afterwards and his body was in the creek or something along those lines. And I think you can leave that bit in, but if they just find Philip dead in the creek and then they also uncover some of the other corpses because they there's a ton of corpses that are disposed in there over the course of the story, uh, we'd actually feel kind of bad about it. Like, we'd think, oh, Philip was just becoming friends with Daniel, and now Daniel's going to be sad, and uh, Philip will never get the chance to be a better person, that sort of thing. And we'll also be wondering, well, who or what killed him? What, what happened here? Now, in the original, there is a scene where Daniel, or he's actually referred to as Greg multiple times throughout the book, so I keep wanting to call him Greg. <laughs> I'm sorry, but uh, there's a scene where Daniel is watching a movie in school one day, and in the movie, there's, for whatever reason, someone says, what would happen if we combined human and dinosaur DNA, which is not the sort of thing that I would imagine seeing in any sort of academic context, so it's really odd. And, but uh, when he sees what it would look like, he realizes, that's the alien that abducted me, and he gets freaked out about it. Whereas, in this one, we'll just have it so that at some point, Daniel's watching the news, or a TV show, or something, and he sees the aliens on TV because some crackpot got footage of it, and he's like, look, there's aliens, they're attacking! And no one really takes it seriously, because they just assume he faked it, you know, like, he's looking for attention, it's like someone saying they saw Bigfoot or something, and Daniel's like, no, no, those are the aliens that took me, I'm telling you, and again, no one believes him, so Daniel will start to feel more and more isolated and like he's in more and more danger at this point, and uh, we'll keep that up that motif, like he'll see the alien ship uh, once in a while while he's out in the woods, or he'll see 
He'll, he'll think he sees aliens in a crowd somewhere, or he'll feel like they're trying to visit him at night or something. And in the original book, Daniel just puts himself under some tinfoil and then they can't get him. Maybe we'll leave that in here somewhere, or maybe not. It's not really important. In the original, he gets a crush on this girl named Julia, who is 15 years old, you know, four years older than him, and then they start dating, and they, yes, they do in fact have sex, which is, um, that's what is referred to as pedophilia in, in, uh, where I'm from. Uh, so we're just not gonna have that in here. We're gonna have, Daniel will have a crush on Julia, and it will not be reciprocated. You know, she'll just be, like, friends with his sister, or maybe some random girl that he meets at some point. It's really not important. The important part is she's not having sex with a sixth grader, because that's weird and creepy and fucked up. The more the aliens visit Daniel, uh, the more his powers will start to develop. Because like I said, he can already see dead things and he notices that they can move things with their minds and stuff. So we're gonna give Daniel some opportunity to like experiment and also because he's like going through puberty and stuff, maybe it's just natural, and he'll start to develop powers of his own. Now, the problem with the original book is that he can he's just a god. You know, he can warp reality, do whatever the hell he wants all the time with no restrictions whatsoever. So it was kind of hard to pick powers that he could have that would still fit with the original motif of this. And I thought about it for a little while and I was like, okay, we'll just have it so he can, like I said, see the dead. Uh, we'll have it so he can astral project because he does that a lot actually. And we'll give him like telekinesis or maybe telepathy or something, you know? So he'll be powerful, but he won't be omnipotent. You know, that's the important part because in the original book, he just starts to realize kind of out of nowhere that he has all these powers, whereas in this, if he sees the aliens do it, maybe he'll be inspired to try it out himself and realize, oh, okay, I can do this. And he'll realize uh, through some experimentation what the limits of his power are and that, you know, put in some actual tension, put in some rules, put in flaws, do something, anything to make it interesting because it's just boring to watch a god go around and do things without any effort. And so, uh, life will go on like this for a while. Maybe Daniel will, like, attack some of the aliens when they come for him, and so they'll back off for a while, and he'll just be living life uh, on his own for the next couple of years, not really making a big deal about who he is or anything. And at one point, the aliens will come back, and they'll take him, they'll try to abduct him again, and he'll say, enough is enough, and he'll just kill them. And, you know, he'll blow up their ship, just like in the original book, but he'll have a little bit more of a difficult time doing it. He'll have to fight some aliens and stuff, so we'll have an actual thrilling action sequence or something. And then he'll realize, you know, with these powers, I could, like, I could save people. Yeah, that sounds awesome. So he just becomes a vigilante. You know, he, he goes off, starts fighting robbers and tracking down murderers and stuff, and he just kills them. And obviously this eventually gets noticed by people, uh, but they don't know who he is. There's like, oh, hey, these murderers keep getting killed. That's that's so weird. And um, at one point in the original story, he goes to have dinner with Julie and her family, and he just kind of reads her dad's mind and realizes he's a serial killer, and he has some cronies as well who are also serial killers, and so he just kills him right there. And um, <laughs> in this version, we're just going to have... I, I, I genuinely don't even know. He'll, he'll have to somehow find, like, actual evidence. Uh, maybe he can stumble across it, maybe he can actively be searching for it after he finds a dead body, but he will somehow come across actual evidence that Julia's father is a serial killer, and just like before, he'll kill him. He might feel kind of bad about it, but he, he will kill him over it. And I think it is a good idea, because in the original story, he kills him right in front of Julia, or Julie, it's, it actually goes back and forth several times. I'm, I'm sticking with Julie because it sounds a little better. But in the original, uh, he kills Julie's dad right in front of her, and then he implants the memories of him attacking women in there so she understands why he did it, which is just... J Jesus Christ, <laughs> that sounds fucking horrible. So we, I think there is a good idea at the core there, though. I think the, the idea of him killing her father and her seeing it and being horrified by it, rather than just, oh, okay, I understand why you did it, uh, he'll, I think that's a good idea. So we'll leave that bit in, she'll be nearby, and Daniel doesn't realize it until too late, and he kills her dad, and she's like, Daniel, you killed my dad, and you have mind powers, what the shit? And after that, he might try to 
explain things to her and whether she listens or not is really not that important because at this point in the original book an assassin comes along and kills Julie but uh, Daniel just grabs her soul, puts it back in, good as new, and then Julie doesn't do anything for the rest of the book. So it really doesn't matter. And so in this version, I'll keep it there. The assassin will kill Julie, and Daniel will be super pissed about it, and he'll go to the assassin and be like, why did you kill her? Why? And he'll be like, oh, I was hired by this guy. And then the other guy he'll go to will be like, oh, I was hired by this guy. And he'll go back in uh, a little ways until he eventually realizes, oh, it was the aliens that did it. So then he'll decide, okay, you fuckers are going to die. And so he'll go off looking for them again, trying to find, like, their home planet or something. Because, remember, he will have only blown up, like, the one ship they sent to Earth here. And while he's out searching for them, some mysterious force will grab him and take him away somewhere. Uh, again, just like the original, this turns out to be God. Or, well, kind of God. It's like a piece of God. It's not, not important. It's, it's not explained very well in the original. I don't understand it. It's just, he's kidnapped by God, and then while, when he's kidnapped, in this version, he'll actually learn some stuff about how this universe works and about where his powers comes from. Now, Onision's version has it as there's this black rock inside his head which gives him his godlike powers, but it never really explains how the rock got there, or what it is, or where the rock comes from, or anything like that. So I had to actually think and reach a bit before I could come up with a proper explanation for how this could work. Basically, uh, in the original, God's sister, God actually killed her at some point, and we'll, we'll get back to that later, but uh, we'll just have it so that in this version, Daniel is either a, a piece of God's sister's power who just became sentient somehow, or a piece of her power will have latched onto him when he was in the womb or a baby or something, and that's where his powers come from. Like, great, it's it's a little out there, a little far-fetched, and I would probably have to do some real uh, world-building to er, world building and foreshadowing to make it make any real sense, but at least it is an explanation, which is a hell of a lot more than Onision gave us. And uh, while he's up there with God, he's like, whoa, okay, so you're this, you're God, you created the Earth and everything, uh, and he starts asking questions about the universe, and God basically just tells him, like, yeah, there's lots of other gods out there, uh, that sort of thing, and I noticed you were here after a while, so I just decided, hey, I gotta grab you, and now I'm just gonna kill you. So he tries to kill him, and Daniel also tries to kill God, while, and while they're fighting, it doesn't go very well, because Daniel is just a tiny piece of a god's power, whereas God is, you know, an actual god. But... He's not just some regular human, so he can actually fight him to an extent. However, before God can actually kill Daniel, uh, all this power being released attracts other gods, and then they're like, hey, God, it, it's kind of difficult to refer to him. Let, let's call him Yahweh, okay? Because he's basically the biblical God, uh, but Greg just makes him into an asshole because he wants to whine about religion or something, but we'll just call him Yahweh, okay? I apologize if that offends anyone, but the other gods are like, Yahweh, what are you doing? You're destroying stuff. You're causing too much trouble. You're kind of a dick. We don't like you anymore, so we're just going to kill you. And so they do it, and they don't really even think about what Daniel's doing. They don't give a shit about him. They're just like, hey, this guy has been causing trouble for many thousands of years, so we're just going to get rid of him now. They're, they're tired of his shit. Um, but when they kill him, Daniel somehow absorbs his power. You, you know, like, I don't know precisely how that would work. I'm imagining something kind of like the Shards of Adenalsium, where you can kill the host and the power is there, or maybe just, like, they destroy his mind first, and there's a brief moment where Daniel can just, like, reach out, grab the power, and absorb it into himself. But the point is, Daniel becomes a full god at this point. Like, he's, he's still not all powerful the way he was in the original book, but he is, like, powerful enough to create life and to create uh, entire planets and solar systems and stuff. And so the other gods are like, oh, shit, um, well, you know what, kid? We're gonna, we're gonna put you on probation for now. Like, just don't cause any trouble. We'll let you keep doing your thing. So then using his newfound powers, Daniel goes to the aliens again, who he was originally planning to just blow up their planet and kill all of them because, you know, they killed Julie, the girl he had a crush on, and he's so mad about it. Uh, but after some cool-down time with 
God and everything, he realizes, okay, like, maybe I don't have to kill him, I just need to figure out what's going on. And so he goes to him and communicates with him a little while, uh, a little bit, and after a while they eventually iron out that they were after him and they tried to kill Julia, or kill Julie specifically to attract him here, because they were not expecting him to be a full god, they were just expecting him to be a powerful human, essentially. Uh, and they wanted to, all the experiments and everything were them trying to take his power out so that they could have it, and they wanted to somehow use it to fight God, because, or Yahweh, I mean, uh, because Yahweh was just being an asshole. You know, he, he's a tyrannical god. He demands sacrifice, all that sort of thing. And so that would be, you know, it would fit in with Greg's idea of not really liking religion, but at least it would, you know, have an actual villain. Well, it's still not great, I'll, I'll admit to that. It, it's still not great, but... You know, and at this point, maybe we could find out that, you know, God, or Yahweh killed his sister because, I don't know, whatever reason. In the original book, it's that Yahweh was jealous of the way she created humans, and then out of jealousy, he raped her, and then out of shame for raping her, he killed her because Onision's a fucking weirdo, and, like, every other character in his books is raped and or murdered. In this case, it is at least making some sort of a point. It's still not great, but it's pretty much the best I could do without completely rewriting everything. Uh, and then so Daniel, just like in the original, he becomes, you know, the god of Earth. It's uh, still kind of anticlimactic, and he still decides, you know what, let's make Earth a utopia and get rid of all the crime and poverty and everything. But, I mean, it's a little bit better than it was originally, where he just kind of snaps his fingers and resurrects his dead uh, Yahweh's dead sister, who is also his mother, again, not really explained, because he also has a human mother, and she, Yahweh's sister died however many thousands of years ago, and also maybe God is his father and Daniel's the product of rape. It's, it's, none of it's, none of this is explained. Like, that's why it's so hard to come up with stuff for this, because there's just nothing to build off of. There's not even an outline or a framework or things I could just, oh, that's kind of good, but I gotta tweak it. Like, there's just nothing here. Uh, but... You know, we'll just end with Daniel being God of Earth and fixing everything. Uh, it's still anticlimactic, it's still a power fantasy overall, but at least there's an actual story here this time. You know, there is actually a reason why the assassin would be doing stuff, there are some actual stakes and tension to why, uh, or to all the battles and everything, but, I, I mean, it's still not good. I still think this would be a terrible book, and it would still need a pretty serious rewrite to be even well, even publishable, I think, because when I say publishable, that's a pretty low bar, because some, <laughs> I think, if you've been watching my channel long enough, some really terrible stuff has been professionally published over the years, but yeah, I think that's about everything for Reaper's Creek, and overall, Onision does have some good ideas, I'll give him that, you know, and like I said, I will give him credit that he did sit his ass down and crank out three books, which are not very long books, but you know, he, he did get them out there, and that just goes to show you that execution is everything. You know, I hate when people say, oh, it's good ideas, but, like, the execution is poor, because that really doesn't tell you anything. Execution is always everything. It doesn't matter if you have good ideas, because Onision has good ideas, and look at how his books turned out. Like, there's just, it, it's everything in, is in how you do it. Everything is in presentation, everything is in uh, the little minutia of one plot point to another plot point. And that's partially why it's so easy for me to rewrite these and make them sound so much better. Because if I were to do a page one rewrite and follow the same basic outline that uh, I just told you guys all about, it would uh, it, it would probably not be as good as I'm making it sound. And I really don't think I'm making it sound all that good to begin with. But, well, you know, I, I don't really have much else to say. I, I finally did it. I did read Onision's books, so you can stop bothering me about it. I still think... Yes, they are terrible. I, I think we're all in agreement there. And I, I didn't quite review them, but like I said, other people have done that better than me. And, you know, share this video around and stuff, because I spent way too long on this, and I need to justify that with ad revenue. So just sh share this around, like the video, comment on it, all that stuff. All right, this is the part where I have to read off patron names. So uh, thanks to all of you guys, and thanks especially to... Apo Savalainen, Olivia Rayan, Ava Toomer, Brother Santodes, Christopher Quinten, Deanna Dahim, 
Ambis, Emily Miller, Joel, Carcat Kisune, Liza Rudakova, Madison Lewis Bennett, Microphone, Sad Mardigan, Tobacco Crow, Tom Beanie, Vacuous Silas, Ve Victus, and of course, Yakov Merkin. All of you guys, you you are all seriously just the best. Just just the bestest best people ever. Without you, I would not be able to do this. And if you want to get your name on here, then donate to my Patreon page. Why not? A anything helps. A dollar a month, that's that's more than most of you will ever give me. But, you know, it's more than my father ever gave me, certainly. So, you know, if uh, if you want to help, then, you know, get your name on here and, uh, you know, do, do stuff. Thanks. Bye.